All right, case one, what is the diagnosis? Crickets. And if you're wrong, it's okay. It's a safe place to be wrong. Again, I, I can, can go. go ahead. So looks like an endophytic kind of growth where it's kind of invaginating. Um, and it looks like there's maybe acantholysis. Good. And kind of looks like an expanded hair follicle. So what do you think it is? A warty dyskeratosis. Yeah, warty dyskeratoma, warty D. Because you've got the the key is that it's acantholysis and dyskeratosis. Here's the the acantholytic rounded up detached keratinocytes, and then here's the dyskeratosis, which looks kind of like plump parakeratosis is the way I think of it. The the coron and grains, and then here you can see nice acantholysis, giving you this kind of like invaginated, um, almost frond like appearance. I think. And um, and the, the key to it is that it's acantholytic and dyskeratotic, and it's in a kind of invaginated cystic lesion, usually on the face, right? So we know that there's multiple lesions that can give acantholysis and dyskeratosis, and the different way to classify them depends on their distribution clinically and their shape microscopically. So if, it's, if it looks like an invagination, or sometimes it'll look totally like a cyst, because remember, anything that's invaginated that has an opening to the surface, like a punctum, like you'd see in a... Uh, follicular cyst, epidermoid cyst, whatever. If you cut straight down the middle, you might get um, a cut through the punctum and get to see the opening of the surface. But if you cut anywhere to the side of that, you're going to just see a cyst. So this lesion sometimes looks just like a cyst rather than showing that nice connection to the surface. So if you only learn this pattern, you're going to miss ones that are going to sometimes look like this and be cystic and not have a good uh, connection. Okay, so that's case one, warty dyskeratoma. All right, uh, number two. What did you guys think this was? I can take this one. Um, so at least just from this view, I see hyperkeratosis and acanthosis. Um, it's pretty kind of thin and a little bit more plate-like, not like super dramatic acanthosis. Um, right. And I think for this one, the diagnosis came a little bit more clear when we zoomed into higher power. Okay. Well, what would you think from low power? What did you, like, you know, what was your initial impression when you first looked at it from low power? So some sort of acanthoma, like a seb or a flat ward or a yeah. large cell acanthoma. Those are all kind of Perfect. in my different um, I'd, add, I'd add solar lentigo to that list personally. I feel like flat, thin sebs and solar lentigos have a lot of overlap to me. I, I kind of think they're on a spectrum, honestly. So what do you think it is going closer? I think it's a large cell acanthoma. Yeah. Uh, the cells are certainly large, but they don't look atypical for like an actinic keratosis. And then I think when we like go over to the side, you can kind of see a more abrupt cutoff between like the large cells and the smaller cells. This one doesn't show it as beautifully as some, but there, that's pretty good. Yeah, you can see the normal keratinocytes in the background are kind of small, and all of a sudden they get really big, but they're all kind of uniformly large. And there's uh, usually orthokeratin rather than para on top. So some people call these large cell acanthoma. I've always kind of conceptually thought of these as basically solar lentigo with big cells. That's a kind of simple way for me to remember them because they have a lot of features that look like a, a flat seb um, or a macular seborrheic keratosis or a solar lentigo, but the cells are quite a bit larger. And also sometimes I, I feel like sometimes when I th I'm thinking about this, I feel like I often see solar lentigo and pigmented actinic keratosis kind of intermingled together in the skin. Uh, not so much in this particular example. So sometimes I'll also, if I'm thinking about this, I'll end up saying, oh, it's pigmented a a a AK plus solar lentigo. So sometimes I do that. But um, in my former practice, I never really used the term large cell acanthoma because I think my dermatologists weren't, weren't used to us using that term. And I thought it would get me phone calls asking like, hey, what does this mean? What do I do with this? But I think of these as just benign lesions that are probably on a spectrum with solar lentigo. That's my conceptual way of thinking of it. So good. Okay, case number uh, three. This is a nice one. All right, so there is there's like a follicularly based invagination of the epidermis filled good. with all this keratin debris, and it looks like just a widened follicle. 
um, associated with a little keratin cyst, and then these wide finger-like projections coming off of the epidermis. Um, so it looks like either, even from low power, even like a big dilated pore of liner, but I'm sort of favoring a, a um, pilar sheath acanthoma just based on the those thickening projections. Excellent. That's a perfect description and exactly what the differential is, is that you've got the invagination that's dilated and so very similar to dilated pore of liner, which to me is basically the the punctum of a of a epidermoid cyst or a follicular infundibular cyst and a dilated pore of liner look essentially identical and I think they really probably represent just two ends of the same thing but when you get these you even large kind of finger like processes like you said kind of the reedy that are are puffed up and expanded out from what looks like a dilated pore then you can use the name pilar sheath acanthoma if you want to get fancy. So I think this is actually a pretty nice example of what pilar sheath acanthoma is supposed to look like, but really it's kind of one of those lesions that's on a spectrum with dilated pore of Weiner. And then the, the cells, of course, are very bland keratinocytes, um, and just the, the reedy are expanded. And uh, my Dermpath mentor and fellowship, Dr. Doug Parker at Emory, he always said it was like someone took like a bicycle pump and pumped up each of the reedy and they kind of inflated and bulged out from the dilated pore. And I thought that was kind of a fun way to uh, think of, of what a pilar sheath acanthoma can look like. Where do you think we are on the body anatomically? So I see some skeletal muscle bundles there. Yeah, so, um, so maybe like on the, on the face. Yeah, exactly. When you see skeletal muscle in the dermis, you're almost always going to be on the face or sometimes the neck because the platysma muscle can kind of come up into the dermis and subcutis. So yeah, you can even see there's muscle right up here, right? So yeah, the face would be a great place, and these often do occur on the face. All right, case four. Okay, that looks like a seborrheic keratosis. Good. Um, I see a lot of squ uh, kind of like squamous eddy, so maybe irritated. Yeah, good. It's a perfect acanthotic lesion of bland keratinocytes with nice horned pseudocyst, so it's a seb. And when you get a seb plus the nice swirly, whirly squamous eddies, then that's what you call an irritated seborrheic keratosis. And these have a lot of overlap with what other lesion that looks a lot like this? Uh, inverted follicular keratosis. Yeah, IFK. Inverted follicular keratosis looks a lot to me. They probably either closely related on a spectrum with one another. It's like a IF, uh, an irritated seb that's just grown and bulged downward into a hair follicle, then that's what an inverted follicular keratosis is. They have these same swirled, whirled, squamous eddies. And people often ask, you know, like, and I guess it's more of a beginner question, but maybe no one's explained it, that, you know, horn pseudocysts are in the epidermis and have loose, flaky keratin, and they're characteristic of seborrheic keratosis. Squamous eddies are also in the epidermis or within an epidermal-based lesion, and they're made of actual viable living keratinocytes that are swirled and whirled together into a little glassy uh, nodule. And then squamous uh, keratin pearls are going to be in the dermis usually, and they're associated with squamous cell carcinoma. And they're going to either be, sometimes they start to look like this, but they're like sitting down actually in the dermis because they're invasive in the dermis. And then they begin to build up a little whirl of parakeratin rather than this loose flaky stuff. And so that's what a, a, a keratin pearl looks like. I don't have any of those to show you today, but you've seen them many times in squamous cell carcinoma. So those are three um, different whirls of keratinocytes or keratin uh, that are kind of circular and that people sometimes get confused about because the names... Um, the names are different, but they all kind of involve whirling and swirling keratin and keratinocytes. So good job. Irritated seborrheic keratosis. All right, this is one we don't see every day. Who wants this one? Case five. Uh, I'll take it. So, I mean, the first thing that stands out is um, the blue infiltrate, which is probably a big collection of lymphocytes. Yeah. Um, you can see towards the, the top, it actually has uh, a little squamous epithelial lining, um, so probably represents a, a true cyst. And then in the middle of what we're focusing on there, it looks like they're starting to form a little um, follicular unit, uh, which would make you think in this context a uh, branchial cleft cyst. Yeah, great. This is this is a good example, I think, of branchial cleft cyst. They're lined by stratified squamous 
epithelium. They tend to have a really dense lymphocytic infiltrate around them, sometimes with germinal center or, or lymphoid follicle formation like we're seeing here. And, um, and the, the key, I mean, they do have a, a pretty distinct appearance, but the real key is recognizing where it is on the body. They're usually like below the angle of the jaw, like in the upper part of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, that region right there where, where the branchial clefts would have been embryologically. So, and uh, I'm certainly no embryology expert. It's a lot more complicated than I can remember. But that's an example of a branchial cleft cyst and something that I only rarely have seen in practice, actually. Maybe they all go to like pediatric pathologists or something, but they um, do not come across my scope very often. So stratified squamous, dense lymphoid infiltrate, below the angle of the jaw, branchial cleft cyst. All right, number uh, six. Initially, I guess some thoughts were like HS or um, a pilonidal sinus uh, or like an acne conglobata picture. Great. Those are all, all great ideas because they're all things that give you kind of really robust inflammatory and reactive response um, associated with some cystic kind of process. So yeah, the, the key is in, in these kind of situations is the clinical and the location. Is the skin, the skin surface here, but we have this bulging overgrowth here where you have really reactive acanthosis of the epidermis. If we go and zoom in, like you mentioned, there's hemorrhage, there's reactive blood vessels, there's a loose kind of myxoid background. So this is basically granulation tissue with hemorrhage here. And then down deeper, there's inflammation and the granulation tissue becomes more dense and collagenized. So that's basically converted into scar. This is scar tissue. It's got parallel fibroblasts and prominent vessels. And then even deeper down, you begin to see some naked hair shafts that are in here. There's a hair shaft, there's a hair shaft. So this is a pilonidal cyst or pilonidal sinus or pilonidal sinus tract, uh, whatever name you like. I often will use pilonidal cyst slash sinus in my report when I sign them out because it's basically all on the same spectrum. And these are usually in the superior gluteal cleft, right? And one thing I think that's important to note is that even though the name cyst is there, I would say the majority of times I see these, I don't actually see a stratified squamous epithelial lined cyst that you can have them with the cyst intact, but more often the cyst has ruptured and all you've got left is basically this kind of vertical band of granulation tissue, scar, fibrosis, inflammation, sometimes with keratin debris and naked hair shafts, all embedded in it. And it's in the, the midline gluteal cleft, you know, right around the coccyx area. So that's, that's basically the way um, that I recognize these. And um, it, you got to have the right location. And then if you have granulation tissue and it's in that location and clinically they want that, that's probably what it is. Um, and like you said, there are other entities that can certainly have overlapping features uh, with this. If this were anywhere else on the body, I'd say, oh, probably it's just a ruptured cyst or ruptured hair follicle. And they've really, you know, manipulated and picked at it and gotten a lot of reactive kind of polypoid granulation tissue and reactive um, epidermal change over it. Okay, good job. So pilonidal cyst or sinus tract. Uh, case seven. No takers here because there's no, this no epidermis on it, right? Yeah. So this one, um, at first glance, um, kind of reminded me of like a ganglion cyst, although there's more like um, little kind of like villus type things in there, sure. um, and it's more kind of hyperplastic, so I needed weed in to kind of help with this, but I felt like what fit best was a metaplastic synovial cyst. Hmm, that would probably work too, actually. Uh, this is, I know these are all um, uh, Dr. Faringer's uh, slide set, so, so I'm totally, uh, these are all new to me, I just basically looked at them today, so uh, but yeah, I think that the clinical does uh, make a difference there, and there certainly can be a lot of overlap. So this is labeled as ganglion cyst. A lot of times when I see a ganglion cyst, it's just a dense collagen, uh, dense regular connective tissue, dense collagen lining with, uh, with no actual lining cells. So it's really a pseudocyst, if you will, although occasionally you can have some synovial lining in it. They may be filled with kind of bluish mucin, myxoid material, which is basically uh, synovial fluid. But a lot of times that's totally washed out, like the, is the case here. It's all washed out during processing. Sometimes that can leak into the surrounding tissue and give you zones that look kind of myxoid or loose and mucinous. 
Um, it just varies from case to case. This case, whatever we want to call it, is definitely very irritated and, and inflamed. The wall, instead of being just dense regular connective tissue, the wall is basically granulation tissue and fibrosis, really thick layers of it. So it could be a ganglion cyst that's been ruptured. A lot of times people try to smash their ganglion cysts, like with a real heavy book or something, and get them to rupture. So it's a ganglion cyst that could have been ruptured or manipulated. But the other thing that can look just like a ganglion cyst, particularly when they have this thick, robust granulation tissue, is a bursa, a chronic uh, proliferative bursitis comes from a bursa that gets inflamed and gets like, you know, cycles of irritation and reactive change over time. And both ganglion cysts and um, inflamed irritated bursa can get this like deposits of fibrin in the center. So these, these that can look kind of like little tiny um, oval uh, bodies that are loose floating in the middle, or they can be attached and kind of have a villous um, appearance like you mentioned. But they're actually not really made of much cellularity. They're pretty much all dense fibrin, sometimes with a little bit of histiocytes and fibroblasts kind of starting to organize like you have here. But your, your uh, point is well taken that a metaplastic synovial cyst, which is basically the idea is that if you have a foreign body, um, you can get um, synovial metaplasia around it. You particularly see this around like uh, breast implants. The body kind of reacts and makes this kind of synovial-like a pseudo lining that kind of walls off the foreign material, whether it's a breast implant or something else. And then you can get, if that material comes out, what the wall of that looks like is very much similar to um, the pattern that you see in an irritated ganglion cyst or an irritated um, bursa. To me, the only way to tell is really the location and what the, the surgeon thought it was. If it connected down to the joint space, it was probably a ganglion cyst. If it sits where a bursa normally is anatomically, it's probably an irritated uh, uh, bursa with kind of granulation tissue. Or if there was a foreign body there, then it could be a synovial, a metaplastic synovial cyst. So great, that's a good, good differential. So this is a very robust example of reactive change in a um, ganglion cyst in this case. And again, there's no lining here, right? It's just, it's just granulation tissue, and then all of a sudden you got some fibrin and empty space. Good job. Okay, case eight. What's this one? Anyone? It's an inverted follicular keratosis. Bold and correct. Two points. Good job. You got it. Exactly. This is it's got keratinocytes and squamous eddies, right? Just like an irritated um, separate keratosis, but it kind of has this uh, downward pushing uh, borders that bulge down into the dermis. Sometimes these can really have almost like a dumbbell shape. They can really push way down a follicle. And um, I feel like they often have some keratinocyte atypia because they're often inflamed and irritated looking. Um, they're often, uh, sometimes they're ulcerated on the top and have a lot of stromal edema and um, an inflammation in the dermis. So I feel like, and uh, they're often transected because they push down. So when they get shaved off by the dermatologist thinking they're gonna maybe be a squame or something like that, um, you often don't see the base. So if there's atypia, sometimes I'll mention that, that I see atypia, I think it's reactive, but I don't see the base of the lesion. And if it grows back, do a biopsy again. Um, uh, but if I really favor that it's a, an IFK, I don't, I don't get too hedgy. This one doesn't have much atypia. This looks really nice, and we can see the majority of the lesion. And something that I don't remember being taught, at least, but that I learned in practice over time, is there are two other entities. Well, in, I guess there are three other, I guess, in the differential here. IFK, inverted follicular keratosis, irritated seborrheic keratosis, as we already discussed, but two other things that sometimes can come into this spectrum. One is trichelomoma. Trichelomomas have a warty surface like this, and when they get irritated, they can kind of give this a uh, bit of a squamous eddy look, and they have some outer root sheath differentiation, obviously, which is analogous to what you can see in an IFK, which kind of is growing down into a follicle structure or or recapitulating a follicular growth. Either way, you want to think about it. And the other thing um, is clear cell acanthoma. Even though this one doesn't particularly look like it, I've certainly seen cases where I kind of struggled to tell apart clear cell acanthoma, trichelomoma, and inverted follicular keratosis because they all can kind of have these large reedy that are kind of smooth and bulging down, and they all have this kind of pale uh, appearance to them that looks different than the adjacent epidermis. Uh, so I think those are all three benign things, 
um, that can look like one another. And the main thing is that you don't confuse them with a carcinoma. So a nice example of inverted follicular keratosis. Um, here's case uh, number nine. Who wants this one? I can take this one. Okay. Okay, so just from low power, it kind of looks like normal skin. Good. Um, there's something deeper down in the dermis, I think. Yeah. And it looks really, like, pink. Um, deeper down, it looks like that kind of, like, tricholemal keratinization. Good. Yeah. So this is one where if you didn't see this piece down here, you would really maybe struggle with the diagnosis. Right. So what would you so call this? That makes me think of a pilar cyst, but yes. there's actually another piece of this that made me think of a hydrocystoma, like another part. Good. I know exactly what you're talking about, and I will show in a second. This is obviously a pilar cyst, like you said, or trichelemal cyst if you like, and it's made of bland keratinocytes and it lacks a granular layer and has this very abrupt transition into dense, solid pink keratin, usually without very many uh, nuclei, uh, nuclei retained, but sometimes you can have some retained nuclei and parakeratosis, but usually it's just dense, homogenous keratin in here rather than the loose, flaky keratin of the um, epidermoid cyst or um, uh, follicular infundibular cyst, whatever name you like for that lesion. So yeah, this is a detached pilar cyst. And when you go up to the dermis, you mentioned right here, you've got a cystic lesion that looks a lot like hydrocystoma. It's got a single or double layer of bland cuboidal cells. So what happened here is that the pilar cyst used to be here and it tore away and fell out during, during uh, processing. And what gets left behind is just the little intact basal layer that's hooked onto the dermis with hemidesmosomes and the rest of the cyst has kind of peeled away and left just this single layer behind. So I actually learned this uh, from, uh, from Greg Hostler, one of my friends on, on Twitter and Facebook, and he posted about this several years ago, and I thought, oh, this is really cool. And sure enough, if you look at pilar cysts when they're intact, sometimes you'll begin to see the split happening. So you could, if you just had this, you could totally mistake this and call it a hydrocystoma. No harm would be done. They're both benign cystic lesions. So yes, that's a nice little clue, though, that you can get this hydrocystoma-like pattern when you have a detached pilar cyst. So that's kind of cool. And then over here, uh, if you just had this, but here what we have are little flakes, right? These little spaces that are cleft-like, that's where keratin was. So the other thing that can do this is cholesterol. In certain settings, cholesterol crystals can make these little clefts. Usually they're like longer and more jagged. Um, and also usually if you look around here, you'll actually see there's a little flake, a little wisp of keratin there. And um, if you do a keratin stain, which you don't need to do, you'll actually can stain the little keratin fragments. So this is basically a keratin granuloma, which is the pattern we see when you get a rupture of any sort of cyst or, or keratinized um, structure. When they rupture, the keratin spills out. The dermis does not like keratin, and it makes this granulomatous response uh, to that. So if I just had this, you can say keratin granuloma, which to me means a ruptured follicle or ruptured cyst or some ruptured um, uh, keratinocyte um, structure. And there's also some calcification down here too. So there's calcification. Okay. So that's keratin granuloma and a, from a partially ruptured, at least pilar cyst. Good job. Okay. Now 10. All right. So this one just from low power looks like a severe keratosis. I see some pseudohorn cysts. And yeah. Some um, I see some lymphocytes toward the bottom, so I think it's a little bit inflamed. Yes, agree, inflamed. So inflamed Seb, next case. And I think, actually, that's exactly how I would sign this out in my report in practice. But the reason that it's here in uh, intermediate um, benign uh, epidermal session for you guys is, is obviously something more than just that it's an inflamed Seb. So is there any bonus that you found in here? Yeah, so it took me a while. There's kind of like those little glassy areas in ah, there. Good. And at first I was like, are those squamous eddies? But they don't have nuclei, like you mentioned earlier. Um, there's not really enough like atypia for me to at all consider squame for those to be like keratin pearls. So I think that's amyloid. I think maybe they've been kind of scratching at their sub. Um, so just like keratin-derived amyloid. Excellent job. Oh. This is keratin-derived amyloid, precisely like you said. 
what you have is that homogenized eosinophilic stuff with cracks, uh, little crack-like spaces there. And um, the, uh, the main thing is that you don't worry that about um, systemic amyloidosis like uh, uh, light chain amyloid. This is not light chain. This is keratin derived and keratinocyte derived. It's made of keratin and maybe some other proteins from the keratinocytes as they break down and fall into the dermis. And what's nice in this case is you can actually see that happening. These are basically the equivalent to like cytoid bodies, I think. I think they're very similar to cytoid bodies or individual dying keratinocytes that are kind of massing together and getting pushed down into the dermis. So you can see them individual ones here. You can see the same thing falling out here. And then they're all getting packed and compressed together. And so uh, this process can be seen in a variety of, of uh, benign and malignant um, uh, epidermal and keratinocyte derived lesions in the skin. You can see it under SEBS. You can see it, um, the most common place I see it is actually with basal cell carcinomas. You can see keratin derived amyloid around basal cells. Um, so the main way that you can tell, how do you know this is keratinocyte derived, not um, light chain amyloid? Well, number one, here you can see the process in action, right? But two other things is number one, when you get, um, I think I said number one already, but in any case, I'm going to do it again. Number one, when you get um, a light chain amyloid or, or systemic amyloidosis, it's usually around vessels. It's down in the deeper dermis, around vessels and other structures. It's not here in the papillary dermis usually, whereas the keratin-derived tumor-associated amyloid is packed in the papillary dermis or directly surrounding the tumor, around the basal cell or around the sev. The other thing is that, um, particularly when you've got it right under the epidermis, you can see that in the little crack spaces, there's pigment. And that pigment is melanin because as the keratinocytes break down, the melanin that's also in their cytoplasm falls down into the dermis with it and gets packed and crunched together in between the keratin and protein material that creates the amyloid. So I find that really helpful. And the other time that you see keratin-derived amyloid, of course, is in macular amyloid and um, lichen amyloid which are two, um, uh, obviously, uh, reactive slash inflammatory dermatoses that have, um, or I guess you'd probably classify them as deposition diseases of, of a sort, but basically they have papillary dermal amyloid that's made of keratin and, and keratinocyte-derived proteins, but finding the pigment in those cracks and finding the amyloid right next to the epidermis is the key to recognizing that, and I don't even usually bring it up in my report. I know that you guys are savvy to what this means, but I know that some other uh, physicians may not know about this, and they may see the word amyloid and get very concerned that this could be um, something bad and then you know, do a bone marrow biopsy on the patient. And I actually have seen in the past cases where someone called something like an amyloid or macular amyloid, and actually the patient got referred to, to get worked up for systemic amyloidosis. So because of that, I now usually add a comment in my report, especially if it's for a non-dermatologist, this is not associated with systemic amyloid, this is just keratin-derived amyloid, no association at all. Uh, just to avoid any sort of confusion because obviously systemic amyloidosis is such a severe uh, disease and you wouldn't want someone to get worried over something totally benign like this. Okay, nice work. Uh, case 11. Oh, beautiful example too. All right, so deeper in the dermis, we have a really thin walled cyst that looks kind of deflated. Um, like maybe there wasn't more like oily substance in there. Um, not really seeing any keratin or anything else um, in the contents. And then also I see some adnexal structures in the wall. So I'm just seeing some sebaceous glands from here, yeah. not seeing any hair follicles. Um, so what do you think it is? Uh, steatocystoma. Good, you got it. Steatocystoma. See, you guys know all this stuff already. I don't even know why I'm, I'm giving you this lecture. You already know it. Yes, the adacystoma, the key, the classic thing you want to find is a sebaceous gland draining directly into the wall of cyst. You don't always see that, though. So I don't require that for the diagnosis, but I love when I get to see it. The thing that you really want to see is this. The cyst lining is unique. It's the adacystoma, right? It has this crinkled, very jagged, sawtooth, wavy, whatever name you like, lining. And it's got this dense, bright pink or red kind of cuticle here. And this is analogous to what you see in the sebaceous duct or right near the isthmus of the hair follicle as the sebaceous duct drains into the normal hair follicle. If you look, if you see a good cut through a hair like that, you'll see this crinkly kind of lining with the pink layer uh, there in the sebaceous duct. So if you like, this is technically a true sebaceous 
cysts. All the things that get labeled as sebaceous cysts by surgeons and other non-dermatologists, of course, are, are follicular cysts or epidermoid cysts, whatever name you like, but they're not actually anything to do with sebaceous glands. And this is a true cyst of sebaceous gland and sebaceous duct, so steatocystoma. So if I just see a lining like that, to me, that's enough to call steatocystoma. Sometimes if you get small hairs in them, some people will call that vellus hair cyst. Uh, it's kind of debate over what, what you believe a vellus hair cyst is. If it, some people say they have a lining that looks like an epidermoid cyst and has multiple hairs. Some people say it looks like steatocystoma and has multiple hairs. Um, it's, there's an overlap here. So in any case, I would say this is a very nice, beautiful example of steatocystoma. All right, next one, 12. Okay. Um, so from low power, there's ecanthosis, uh, hyperkeratosis, and there's kind of like a little papule in the middle. Uh -huh. um, and you could see kind of intrapidermal, uh, like a cantholysis. Yep. Um, and it kind of has these uh, papillary fronds projecting from the basal layer mm -hmm. into the space. Um, you certainly can also see discurrotic cells, uh, like bradyosinophilic uh, corons. Yeah. Um, you know, I think uh, if it was just more invaginated, I would call it a tiny little warty D. Um, in this case, if it is like an isolated single lesion, um, so you can call it like uh, a cantholytic dyskeratoma. Yes, the, this is another one of those where it, the pattern is acantholysis and dyskeratosis, right? We've got the cells falling apart, and when they get acantholytic, they, they are not stretched out, hooked up to their neighbor keratinocytes, so their cell sticks together, it kind of bulges, uh, crunches up next to the nucleus, and that makes it look a lot more dense pink because the keratin filaments, instead of being stretched out like they are here, they're all bulged up around the nucleus, so it has this very dense pink look. So that's one way that helps you to tell that, yes, what you're dealing with is acantholysis. Um, and then you get to see them starting to turn into dying cells and dyskeratosis, so corons and grains. And if this is a single incidental lesion that you just happen to see in the background, say, on a melanoma excision, you could say it's focal acantholytic dyskeratosis. If it's a lesion that was bigger and was biopsy clinically because they thought it was maybe a SEB, you could call it an acantholytic dyskeratotic acanthoma, a solitary kind of flat lesion or, or you know, you know, kind of acanthotic lesion um, that was, you know, the intent of the biopsy. If it was multiple itchy bumps on the trunk, then you could call it Grover's disease. And if it was an endophytic kind of invaginated lesion, you could call it warty dyskeratoma. All of these are benign processes that involve acantholysis and dyskeratosis. The difference is really clinical and um, and what you uh, what name you want to apply to it. So there's not a not a real significant difference here. The main thing, of course, is that if you is the one thing that would be more problematic is Derrière's disease, which you would have you know large plaques of this clinically would be very different. But the same pattern, you can have this exact pattern if this were a biopsy from Derrière disease. This would look uh, just like this, only usually more multifocal, but on a small biopsy, unless you were told the clinical, you might not be able to tell that. So, exactly. I think this one's labeled as a focal acantholytic uh, dyskeratosis, although to me it's big enough that I, I would probably, if they had a solitary lesion, which is what it looked like they were biopsying here, I would probably call it um, acantholytic dyskeratotic acanthoma, just like you said, unless they had multiple bumps, and then I'd call it Grover's. So, um, so that's a good pattern to learn because you can get multiple diseases for the, the price of one. And here's a nice example of something. Who wants this one? Case 13. And you can just tell me if you think you know what it is, just tell me what the answer is. And the only reason for this is because I know you guys know how to describe stuff and I want to make sure I get through all the cases without making you late for your clinic. So, Mucosil. Boom. Got it. Mucosil. Or mucus extravasation phenomenon, or that's not extravasation, that's the wrong word, that means coming out of a vessel, but um, there is another word for it that's kind of more fancy, but mucus seals what I like. The idea is you're in the lip, right? We've got stratified squamous epithelium without a granular layer, without a corneal layer, so, and it's got kind of that pale glycogenated look, so that's mucosa, and there's skeletal muscle there, and this is a minor salivary gland, small lobule of glands that are rich in mucin filled cells and these of course are going to connect up to little ducts and so but this seeing this and and the stratified squamous mucosa tells you you're in the lip the mucosal lip 
And then here, what you have is this cystic space, and it's actually a pseudocyst. It's lined not by epithelium, but by a thick layer of histiocytes, which are filled with kind of gooey mucin material. They kind of look almost like kind of foamy, but instead of having tiny vacuoles, they actually just have this kind of fluffy, loose stuff in there. So basically the idea is that a duct ruptures, um, a salivary duct ruptures, and the mucus and, and salivary secretions spill out of it, and then the histiocytes come in and mop it up. So kind of like how we had the keratin granuloma earlier from a ruptured keratin-filled structure, this is what happens when you rupture a mucus-filled um, ductal structure in the um, oral mucosa. So this is mucosal. Very nice. All right. Uh, 14, what's the diagnosis for this one? Dermoid cyst. Dermoid cyst, very good. And this is something I rarely ever see. Again, I, I imagine probably these go to pediatric pathologists. The lining of the cyst to me looks just like a follicular infundibular cyst or epidermoid cyst or epidermal inclusion cyst. All those names mean essentially the same thing in practice. Um, but what you get is you get a uh, emptying into the cyst, you get sebaceous glands and hair follicles. There's actually real hair follicles with the hair shaft in them here that are emptying into this um, cyst, and there's some hair shafts in the middle as well. But I think the most important thing to be to be confident about the diagnosis of a dermoid cyst is these are developmental anomalies, right? So they should be present since basically birth. And the most common site is gonna be the lateral eyebrow, but they can occur in a variety of other midline um, locations of the scalp, the nose, other places. But really I want to know that it's in a very young kid or that it's been present since they were born. And then ideally you wanna see hair follicles and sebaceous glands emptying into the cyst. So, um, and it, you know, it has sebaceous glands, so you could think of steatocystoma, but the lining is not right for steatocystoma. It doesn't have that crinkly, jagged sawtooth uh, lining. Sometimes you can actually see eccrine um, ducts emptying into the cyst as well in a subset of cases. So that is a dermoid cyst. All right, 15. Uh, diagnosis. And if you have a differential diagnosis, that's fine to say this versus this, that's okay. Seborrheic keratosis. Good. Any fancy name you want to add on it? Maybe clonal. Clonal seb, yeah. And in practice, I sign these out as seborrheic keratosis, okay? With rare exceptions, if I'm not really sure and I'm struggling because it's a small shave, I might say that my differential is a clonal seb, but I can't totally rule out squame. Usually with with practice, you can easily tell these apart from squame, but occasionally you can struggle. I've definitely had cases where I struggled. So this is a, a seb where you get these little islands of cells that look very monotonous, and they look like each other, but they look different. They have kind of this sharp cutoff from the, the background keratinocytes, and then you have another island here. So the fancy name for this, what's the eponym for this, this pattern? It's named after... Borsch. Yeah, Borstiotison. So the Borstiotison effect, and I think in the old days they actually thought it was a, it was called the Borstiotison epithelioma, and now we recognize it's a pattern that you can see in a variety of things. But the idea is that you have this proliferation that all kind of looks like itself, uh, looks like each other, and then it's got this sharp cutoff from the background. Um, so the big differential I think that people struggle with here is Bowen's disease, squamous cell carcinoma in situ. So looking for atypia, high-level mitotic activity, uh, things like that can be helpful um, in sorting those out. But here I think we're totally fine for this being a clonal seborrheic keratosis. All right, case uh, 16. What's this? Clear cell acanthoma. Yeah, this is a beautiful clear cell acanthoma, or as some people like to say, pale cell acanthoma, because the cells are not truly clear. They do have a kind of pale cytoplasm. And in pathology, we call a lot of things clear that are not really clear. You know, clear, like perfectly optically clear, where you only see white, empty space. Um, we do see in some things, but we often call things clear cell that are really like pale gray, pale pink. The things that help you with clear cell acanthoma is it's an acanthotic lesion. It, the most helpful thing to me is this perfectly sharp, discrete cutoff at the periphery, right? It is, you can tell the lesion stops precisely there. And occasionally you'll see it skip. You can see that normal epidermis and then another little layer, depends kind of how you cut through it. 
but the cells are pale. And also they tend to, the pallor is not only because the cytoplasm is pale, but also they have spongiosis between them usually. So the discrete cutoff, acanthotic lesion with pale cells and sponge, usually you're going to have some scattered neutrophils scattering up in here. And at the top, you can have um, uh, areas that look quite like psoriasis, actually. You can have loss of the granular layer, confluent perikeratosis, and neutrophils in the corneal layer, okay? <clears throat> this uh, occasionally, I've had time, I had one time where I, I was worried about a squame, and I thought something was squamous cell on a superficial shave, and they went back to excise it. It was actually clear cell acanthoma. So um, I, uh, I didn't think of those as looking alike, but on a small partial biopsy, actually, you can, or at least I've struggled with it before. So just pointing that out from my, so my mistakes can help you learn. This is a, not an H&E, but a PAS stain, I believe. PAS stain with diastase. So it's deleted, the, dissolved all the glycogen. So there's no staining. But then if we go to the next slide, which is a PAS without diastase, boom, looks totally different. You can see pink everywhere, right? Because these cells, the pallor is due to cytoplasmic glycogen uh, content. So beautiful example of uh, PAS staining with glycogen in a clear cell acanthoma. And I feel like I see them most often on the leg, like the shin is the site I probably see the most commonly. All right, uh, case 17. This is an epidermolytic hyperkeratosis. Yeah, this is EHK, epidermolytic hyperkeratosis. If you have a single lesion that clinically they think is a seb or a wart and you take it off and it looks like this, then you could call it an epidermolytic hyperkeratotic acanthoma or an EHK OMA, as I like to kind of jokingly abbreviate it as. If you see this as a solitary tiny focus, uh, we see this as tiny focus in the background of all sorts of different skin biopsies and excisions as just a, a little incidental finding, in which case I don't even mention it. Or of course, the, the rare cases of people that have germline mutations in keratins 1 or keratins 10, um, which is what creates this, uh, this pattern, then those people have it as a form of ichthyosis. So epidermolytic hyperkeratosis, the key is that you get this appearance of lysis of the epidermis, that the epidermis is falling apart. That's not really what's happening. If the epidermis is falling apart, the cells would die and you get inflammation and all of this, but they're not. Actually, the cells are clear. They have a lot of clear spaces in them and a lot of these pink globules on this particular stain. It looks a little more reddish, but what's happening is that keratins 1 and 10, because of the mutation in the gene, they're not um, arranged properly in the nice long filaments. Instead, they fold incorrectly and they blob up into these globules of keratin. And what's left behind is kind of empty cytoplasmic space that washes out during processing. And it gives this, this clear appearance plus blobs of varying size of uh, pink keratin. And sometimes also you can see purple keratohyaline granules along with this. I feel like you often have keratohyaline granules and parakeratosis over it but in this case, not quite so much, or at least you can't visualize it. So this is uh, epidermolytic hyperkeratosis, EHK. And occasionally I find that people will get these globules confused with the globules of um, Mermesia wart or molluscum. Those both have differences, and I have a video on my YouTube channel if you have trouble with those um, that talk about molluscum and Mermesia wart and how to sort that out. Okay. Uh, case 7, or I'm sorry, 18. So I thought this looked like CNH. Mm -hmm. Me too. It's labeled here as acanthoma fissuratum. Um, and since I don't know the history, I can't tell you for sure. But I would say that looking at this, this looks like classic for chondrodermatitis nodularis helices, CNH. You've got epidermal acanthosis, and it's starting to kind of reach down and grab this stuff underneath. And this is all dead dead dermis and fibrin, fibrinoid necrosis of the dermis, and the epidermis is trying to grab it and extrude it out. So transepidermal elimination phenomenon. I think there's another piece here where you can see it starting to do that. See, it's kind of here you can see it's perforating that stuff out. So the idea is it's similar to perforating disorders, that it's getting the dead dermis that's died due to ischemia, pressure-induced ischemia from, you know, someone's ear resting against the pillow in an older person usually. And then over to the side, because of this chronic ischemia, you get this proliferation of tiny little vessels. See these little tiny vessels? I feel like this ves the vascular pattern is very characteristic for a CNH. And you get this reactive vascular proliferation at the periphery. And in the center, you get fibrinoid necrosis. And if you get a deep enough biopsy, you'll get 
degenerated or dying cartilage. And all of this is trying to be pushed out through the epidermis. So sometimes you'll see an actual ulcer, other times you'll see acanthosis or kind of like a tunnel where the stuff is being pushed through the epidermis. But let's talk about acanthoma fissuratum. So the idea of that is that you get this kind of thick papule or nodule that occurs right behind the ear from wearing glasses, from long-term glasses wearing, it rubs against. I've also seen similar changes where the eyepiece of glasses can rest. Um, and the idea of that is it's just it's kind of basically perigo kind of change uh, from chronic rubbing of the glasses, um, the stem of the glasses against the ear. So if this were like from that site right under where an eyeglass wearer was, then I guess I could accept this as potentially being um, acanthoma fissuratum. But to me, looking at this on a test, I would call this chondrodermatitis nodularis helicis any day of the week. So an acanthoma fissuratum microscopically is nonspecific findings, kind of lichen simplex chronicus, nodularis changes, reactive epidermal changes, and dermal hyalinization oftentimes, sometimes in inflammation, but, but it's really just a, a clinic of pathologic correlation to make that diagnosis. Dr. Gardner, what yes? is staining on the other piece of that? Um, not one, but the other one, what's staining? Oh yeah, great question. I forget to even mention this. This is an artifact. What happens here is that air bubbles, um, uh, tiny, tiny little air bubbles have gotten under here um, in a gap in the cover media and they filled in all the spaces around the keratinocyte. So sometimes you'll see this, it looks black almost, but it's actually, uh, they're actually air bubbles. It's a lot harder to, it's easier to appreciate it on the microscope because you can see the, the three dimensionality of it, but it's a lot harder to see on a scan where I can't kind of focus up and down. See how they're like kind of little air bubbles in, in the space around the keratinocytes, but for low power, it looks like almost black. Usually also on the scope, if you flip your condenser on and off, it'll, the, the, it'll basically suddenly become clear and you can tell, oh, those are air bubbles. But great question. Uh, sometimes I forget to mention these weird artifacts because I just get used to seeing them and I just delete them in my mind automatically. But that's always good to ask. If you see something and you don't know what it is in pathology, ask, find out, because one day that thing might, might trip you up on a case. It might make you make a mistake. So it's always good to, to wonder, what is that? What's going on there? All right, so what's going on here in case number uh, 19? I thought it was Bowens with some clear cell change. Beautiful. Full thickness epidermal keratinocyte atypia, so Bowens disease or squamous cell carcinoma in situ. And over here, and now here you can see nice uh, kind of example of the eyeliner sign. You can see the retained basal layer here, and then all of this area being filled with the atypical keratinocytes. And then over here, it becomes very clear and pale because the keratinocytes are glycogenated. And we know these are not uh, melanocytes. For one thing, full thickness atypia is extremely rare in melanoma. Um, and if you have full thickness atypia, like from epidermal consumption, you will almost definitely see nests and other obvious melanoma features elsewhere. And the other thing is that uh, when melanomas make vacuoles, the cytoplasm of the melanocyte clings to the nucleus. The vacuoles are on the outside. But uh, when keratinocytes have glycogenation and vacuoles, the, the nucleus is left naked and alone in the middle of a, a space. It's like cold and lonely, poor little keratinocyte nucleus. So that's true both in neoplastic keratinocytes and in normal keratinocytes. When they get vacuole artifacts, same thing. They usually get naked nuclei in the middle or sometimes signet ring looking um, vacuole change. That's almost always going to be a keratinocyte when you see that, um, that pattern. So that's an easy way without stains to tell apart melanocytes and keratinocytes when you have vacuoles. Okay. Uh, case number 20. Um, this looks like a granular parakeratosis. Great. You've got a little acanthosis, a thick layer of uh, uh, hyperkeratosis on top with parakeratosis in it. And this is also one that's a little hard to see on a scan, but the, the, gran the para has kind of a purplish look, and that's because it's got all these retained granules. The granules, the keratohyaline granules, are supposed to stop here, but instead they get caught up into the epidermis here, and the reason for this is a little debated and slash complicated, but basically uh, this is axillary granular parakeratosis, and it usually is in the axilla, but occasionally can occur in other sites of the body. So it's one of those things that until you notice the granules, you'll be like, what is this? And then you see the granules and you're like, ah, granular parakeratosis. Really cool. Uh, 21. Uh, Baruch is cyst, cystic papilloma. Beautiful. It is, a, it is a cyst that basically has a lining that looks like a wart. So it's a verrucous cyst. And the idea, I guess, is that you have a cystic, uh, cystic lesion that has HPV uh, change. So you get papillomatous growth, hypergranulosis here, 
sometimes you can get uh, pale kind of uh, pale uh, cell change in here and glycogenation, and you can get tufts of parakeratosis over the tips of the papillae, all the stuff you'd see in a wart. So basically take a wart and make it into the lining of a cyst, and that is a verrucous cyst. All right, 22. Uh, this looks similar to our, our previous trichelemal or pilar cyst. Yeah, it sure does. Out here, the lining is perfect for, it's getting into focus here, perfect uh, keratinocytes that are glassy, direct abrupt transition into dense keratin. So pilar cyst or trichelemal cyst. And this one has what going on in the middle? Like some ossification. Yeah, you've got calcification here, the purple stuff, which you often see in pilar cysts. And occasionally you can actually see metaplastic bone formation, which is what we have here. How do you tell them apart? Well, calcium is kind of just fragmented and chunky purple stuff. Bone is actually going to be made not just of calcium, but calcium and collagen. Osteoid is type 1 collagen that gets um, calcium added on top of it and mineralized. But what you get is in actual bone, you'll have little lacunar spaces with osteocyte nuclei residing in them. So if you see the little space with a, with a cell in the middle of it, that's how you tell it's actually bone, not just calcium. That's the way to tell apart, say, osteoma cutis, which is bone, from calcinosis cutis, which is just calcified debris. I feel like a lot of times uh, people struggle with that, and that's the way to tell them apart. Obviously, it doesn't usually matter. And sometimes if the bone has been here long enough, it'll actually start to organize and become like mature bone, and you'll actually see like concentric lamellar bone lines, which is kind of cool. And the other thing to always think of when you see bone and calcification and keratin debris is to think of a pilomatrixoma. Pilomatrixoma often has um, ossification and calcification because uh, it usually ruptures and creates a dramatic uh, stromal response. But here we've got the nice uh, pilar cyst lining. So this is a pilar cyst or trichelemal cyst with metaplastic bone formation and calcification. Really nice example. We look at those. This is also an artifact. It's an air bubble, but it's like a snowflake. They're really pretty. Sometimes when you get a freshly uh, fresh slide that the media is still wet, you can actually push on it and make the snowflake kind of move. So try that out at your next you know, cocktail party and see if your friends are impressed. Okay, this probably explains my social life to a great degree. Okay, what, um, what do we have here as a diagnosis for 23? Maybe an epidermal nevus? That's a great idea, epidermal uh, nevus. You can think about a seb. It's coming into focus here slowly. Come on. Well, I don't actually see it coming into focus. I'm trying to get it to, but uh, maybe my browser doesn't like the fact that I have like 45 windows open. Uh, let's see. Is there any area in focus? No. Well, we're going to do low power without seeing the cells. I'll tell you they're bland keratinocytes and you've got para on top. I mean, I'm ortho on top and you've got elongated kind of uh, reedy. But the epidermis is actually kind of thin actually up here, right? It's, it's kind of this undulating up and down look. So the overall look of the epidermis is thick, but the actual, any individual point of the epidermis is actually kind of regular or even thin. So um, this, if you had a single lesion in a, or, or a lesion that was kind of bulging cauliflower sort of shape and it's on a kid, you could think of an epidermal nevus. The other thing you could think, what if I told you it was pigmented and on the chest and it kind of had a net-like appearance clinically? You have like carp. Yeah, or... carp, confluent and reticulated papillomatosis, carp. So it's one of those things that really you need some clinical to put that together uh, because they have a lot of overlap with, uh, with SEB and, um, and sometimes with epidermal nevus as well. So this was labeled as carp, and I apologize that it's not getting into focus here, but it's possible that, that it didn't scan clearly because of the air bubble too. Maybe that's the issue. All right, here's 24. I think this one had cornoid lamellae in them. Um, I could be wrong. You got it. Yeah, porokeratosis. Let's see where the um, best cornoid lamella is. There's a bunch of them, actually. Yeah, so this one's more acanthotic and uh -huh. honestly kind of crazy. So porokeratosis, but maybe the ticotrophica. Yeah, that's exactly what I would think about here because there's multiple 
coronary lamellae. None of them are exactly perfect coronary lamellae. So like this is the beginning of one. Here's one here that you've got a stack of para that's kind of leaning. It's not straight up. Underneath you have some little um, dying keratinocytes right here. And you tend to have some little vacuolation or clear cell change. So that's how if I see a stack of para to make sure that I, it's a coronary lamella, I like to see some, some dying keratinocytes and vacuolation underneath. And yes, when I have an acanthotic lesion with multiple coronary lamellae in it, particularly if it's like in the buttock uh, region, uh, porokeratosis tychotropica is kind of a fancy uh, subtype of poro where you get that acanthosis and multiple um, kind of irregular coronary lamellae um, in it. So here's, here's another coronary lamella. Here's kind of a tangled mess of them right here. Very good. So that's what I would call this too, is a, a porokeratosis. And in the right context, I'd raise the possibility of uh, porokeratosis tychotropica. Back to where we were. Okay, 25. So this looks like it's like a cystic space is deeper down in the dermis, and it looks like it's possibly been ruptured. Good. Yeah, so this is basically just an, an epidermoid cyst, follicular cyst, infundibular type, epidermal inclusion cyst, whatever name you like that has been ruptured, and in the rupturing, it's created this really robust inflammatory response with histiocytes and um, uh, keratin flakes and spaces, so keratin granuloma kind of response to a ruptured cyst. So that's all it is, simple ruptured cyst. We see it all the time. Plus, as a bonus, there's a nevus over top of it. And so this is actually a lot of the story is people will have like a long-standing nevus, and suddenly it becomes painful and enlarges. They'll come in and get a a biopsy done and it's a nevus because of a ruptured cyst or a follicle underneath it. Um, it, it had a, a scary kind of clinical presentation, but the nevus itself is just an innocent bystander. It's, it's all about the ruptured cyst. So we see this pretty often. All right, 26. This one, I thought looked like a proliferating pilar cyst. Good, and this is uh, 26. Good, I'm just checking now to make sure that I'm not telling anything wrong. Yeah, it looks great for proliferating pilar cyst or proliferating pilar tumor or proliferating trichelemal tumor, whatever you like. It looks really busy and crazy, almost like a squamous cell carcinoma, but um, because it kind of looks infiltrated, but it's actually a fake infiltration. If you had the whole thing excised, you would see that in the middle it looks very complex, but at the, the edge, the periphery of the lesion, actually is pretty circumscribed. And in the uh, islands here, the cells are glassy, and if you look at individual islands, Sometimes it shows it better than others. You'll actually see what looks very similar to the lining of a pilar cyst. So, but instead of it being one big simple cyst, it's basically got all of these islands kind of growing into the middle. So it's basically thinking about like a pilar cyst that has kind of grown into itself in, in a very disorganized manner. Um, sometimes the, the pilar lining is very easy to see. Other times, like in this one, it's a little bit more nuanced and you have to kind of have some experience uh, appreciating it. And some people believe that all of these are actually squamous cell carcinomas. I do not hold to that view. I, I think you can see them in younger people. You can see them as a large deep nodule without connection to the epidermis, not the way a normal squamous cell carcinoma would grow. Certainly there are uh, rare cases that behave in a malignant fashion, but usually they have either infiltrative growth at the edge or really atypical cytologic features. Um, so yeah, this is, and here's another area where you can see that kind of that's a nice pilar lining where it doesn't have the granular layer and it abruptly transitions into this homogenized um, uh, dense keratin. Good. So proliferating pilar tumor. And then here's 27. This one I thought was also a poro. I think you see the coronary lamella. Here yes. Too. Poro. There's a nice coronary lamella here. If we go to the other edge, if we are lucky and have a big enough shave, here's another one right here. Not quite as beautiful as the the other and look sometimes it's not just two there's like actually a little incipient coronary lamella there and the thing about porokeratosis is what happens between the coronary lamellae stays between the coronary lamellae it can have all sorts of weird changes it can have epidermal acanthosis epidermal atrophy lichenoid change vacuolar interface change really prominent stasis vessels particularly like on the lower legs um, you can see um, actinic keratosis and squamous cell carcinoma in situ even all sorts of weird stuff, and what's weird is you see all this lichenoid and atrophy, and then here's the coronal lamella, and then it stops. It's done. 
So usually it's like for some weird reason as the corner of the melee move their way out and create the ring of porokeratosis, you get all sorts of weird reactive changes in the middle. They can have a wide range. So if you see something you're like, I don't know, there's some weird stuff going on with the epidermis, but I don't know how to classify it. Go look at the periphery of the shave and see if you can find a corner lamella because then you got an easy answer to what you're seeing. And this piece up here, it's very, it's upside down, but very dramatic lichenoid. Like, I mean, if you had to biopsy of that, you'd think it's a lichenoid uh, keratosis or a lichenoid dermatitis of some sort until you saw that at the edge there's a corneal lamella. Very nice. So coral keratosis is relatively common but can be kind of tricky because of the wide range of features. And this is 28. Okay, um, looks like we are on acral site um, and there's like a cyst in the dermis or maybe a pseudocyst actually. Okay. Uh, no true lining, uh, so good for digital uh, mucus cyst. Exactly, digital mucus cyst. If you took this picture right here and you put it in the wrist deep down, I would call it a ganglion cyst. They are supposed to not connect to the joint is what people say, but I swear they look just like ganglion cysts most of the time. You can actually see the mucus in there. Sometimes they can spill out and make a loose mixoid dermal change, um, and like right here, perfect. Sometimes all you'll see is this. If you see a papule on the nail fold and it has a mixoid or mucinous looking loose dermis, it's almost certainly a digital mucus cyst. So sometimes you just see that and don't see a cystic space. Sometimes you see the cystic or pseudocystic space as you properly said, and it's got the mucin in it. Sometimes that washes out. Um, but all of those things, if it's on the proximal nail fold, um, then it's gonna be a digital mucus cyst. Very good. And here's 29. So this one is uh, vellus hair cyst. It's like a little vellus hair hiding in the middle there. We got a tiny cyst, in this case kind of stratified squamous lining. And in there, like you said, there are lots of tiny little hair shafts and some keratin flakes and debris. So this is a vellus hair cyst. There's a, the little vellus hairs right there. Very nice. Sometimes the lining looks more like kind of stratified squamous uh, like a uh, epidermal inclusion cyst, follicular and fundibular cyst. Other times it kind of gets kind of a serrated pink lining similar to steatocystoma. Good. Bella's hair cyst. Uh, 30. This one was good for molluscum. Yeah, beautiful. Molluscum can look cystic, right? It's one of those invaginated things that if you get a cut through the middle, you can see that umbilication, how it how it connects up to the surface. But if you cut just to the side of where it connects, it's going to look like a cyst. And molluscum often ruptures and in, induces an intense dermal inflammatory response. Um, it can uh, I've seen it mimic lymphoma. Uh, also, the keratinocytes of molluscum really important to note. A lot of people because when you see molluscum, you see those Henderson Patterson bodies, and you don't think about anything else. But look at the normal keratinocytes here kind of small, and then go look at the keratinocytes in the molluscum. They are big, puffy keratinocytes. So I've seen times where these, uh, where they, you know, a funny cut didn't show the molluscum bodies and people were actually worried about carcinoma or something. So if I see a little lobule of keratinocytes in the dermis with big puffy looking cells, sometimes I'll cut deeper and find the molluscum there. So ruptured molluscum contagiosum. 31. Bronchogenic cyst. Bronchogenic cyst. Very nice. These are really rare. I don't. I don't know if I've ever seen one in practice. And of course, is it going to not load now on the best, the best case? Oh come on. All right. This is a bronchogenic cyst. These are quite rare, at least in my experience. And you can see this is a cyst that's got kind of a simple lining from low power, and there's a thick layer of smooth muscle around it, which is a relatively, um, that, that's often the case, there's smooth muscle around them. And when you go closer and look at the lining, you can see that this is like respiratory epithelium. It is pseudo-stratified, ciliated, columnar uh, epithelium. And you can see the uh, cilia on the surface here. Let's see if I can get it in focus a little more. Sometimes it's hard to pick those things up on um, on low uh, or on, on, on scanned um, slides. So that's a pretty nice example um, of a relatively rare entity. And there's a, a closer look at the uh, cilia on the surface. Really nice. 
Um, but in addition to having a pseudostratified ciliated lining, sometimes it's more cuboidal, sometimes more columnar. And about half of cases have uh, mucin-filled goblet cells. And I think that's probably what we're seeing here, although it's not totally clear on the scan. But uh, finding goblet cells feature in about half of cases. Let's take one more look over here at the cilia. And then again, the uh, smooth muscle uh, lining around the cyst here. So bronchogenic cysts, and again, these are often in the precordium, the area out in the chest uh, near or over the heart, and also the uh, near the sternal notch uh, is the sites where these uh, typically arise. Just, all right, what's this one, 32? Pilometricoma. Yeah, pilometricoma, and it's got the mixture of blue basaloid matricle cells, the shadow or ghost cells, and um, you're going to have a really brisk uh, giant cell reaction because they almost always are ruptured and spill into the dermis and all that keratin generates um, a lot of response. They usually calcify, at least in some areas, and even can produce uh, well-formed bone. Um, and you don't have to have basaloid matricle cells. Some cases you just see the shadow cells, that right there. And mitotic activity is pretty common and can be abundant in the matricle cells. Uh, don't let that scare you. 33. So this kind of looks like normal skin at this low power, but closer in there are some features of wart. So this I think is Veruca plana. Yeah, Veruca plana. This is a very subtle lesion that from low power doesn't stand out as much. It's just, here's the normal epidermis. It's a little acanthotic. And the surface, instead of the nice finger-like projections of a Veruca vulgaris, you have this just very tiny little little undulating rolling hills, okay? And when you go in closer, you will see hypergranulosis. And again, that little undulation with maybe a touch of para here and there. And oftentimes you see prominent vacuoles around the, the superficial nuclei, like here. Um, you don't always see them, but those right there. And I feel like Veruca plana can have a lot of overlap, honestly, with lichen simplex chronicus. In LSC, um, you get hypergranulosis, and you can begin to get kind of some undulation uh, change. Uh, so the clinical usually can help because these are small, flat, uh, kind of flat macules, um, or, or I guess they're, I guess they technically would be small plaques because they are raised a little bit, um, and they tend to be multiple, and they can kevnerize along lines of trauma, right? Um, like from shaving, you can get them spread in a little line. So that's Veruca plana. Oh, here, that's a good example of how you're beginning to get kind of this pale change around the kind of larger keratinocytes. So this is basically, my, my idea is this is an HPV effect, that the, the cells are kind of getting larger. They're not actual coilocytes, but the nuclei get kind of larger and get a little pale space around them. Um, so that's a nice example of Veruca plana. Uh, 34. Um, a tricholoma. Beautiful trichelomoma. They usually have a warty surface with hypergranulosis and parakeratosis. They have these bulging reedy that push down into the dermis with smooth borders. And what you want to find ideally is clear or pale cell change. This is a really good example. Sometimes it is not so obvious when this represents outer root sheath differentiation. And you can see palisading of the basal keratinocytes, again, just like you'd see in the outer root sheath of a hair follicle. Some people believe that these are viral and caused by HPV, and so they call them like trichelemal verrucas. They believe it's like a wart growing down into a hair follicle. There have been various studies back and forth deciding whether or not there's HPV in these. I, I just call them trichelomomas. And in the middle, they can get kind of busy and stringy and have like little cords and strands that look infiltrative. And when you have a lot of that, you can call it a desmoplastic trichelomoma, which is a totally benign lesion. The main reason we make that distinction is that if you have a, when this is really pronounced, the middle, a small biopsy in the middle of this lesion could look a lot like an infiltrative squam, squamous cell carcinoma or basal cell carcinoma. But see how it has abrupt transition here? So see, that's why it can kind of look a little bit like a clear cell acanthoma. You know, if you're, you can struggle with that sometimes because they can have a very abrupt transition. And there's the nice warty surface. I find the warty surface really helpful. And clinically, they often look like a veruca. The clinical differential is often like veruca versus basal cell. And it'll be like on the nose or something. So that's trichelomoma. Uh, 35. Hydrocystoma. Yep, hydrocystoma often on the cheek or the eyelid, double layer of cuboidal cells. Sometimes they have an apocrine surface, sometimes a flat surface. The distinction to me does not matter. I just call them hydrocystoma. 
double layer of cuboidal though. See, it's like two layers of, of cells around nuclei. And this is one where sometimes a shave will just nip the top of it and they'll want a cyst and you'll see nothing. And if you cut a little deeper, you'll find just this little bit of a lining on the very bottom of the shave and you won't see the cyst. You'll just see the roof of it, just the top. So it's one of those that occasionally that, that will happen. It'll be like this. You can just see that little bit of the surface. So in practice, um, I always think of that. And this looks like it's probably eyelid. Eyelid skin tends to have edema and kind of these multinucleated stellate, I think they're fibroblasts, I don't know for sure. Eyelid skin has kind of a look though. There's a demitus sort of look to it a lot of times. Almost there, 38. Oh, cutaneous ciliated cyst. Oh, did I skip something? Oh, 36, I'm sorry. Cutaneous ciliated cyst. So the key here is in the lining, right? And the lining is this kind of cuboidal to columnar lining with little tiny cilia, and it's really hard to get them to show up on the scan. Here you can see the little little cilia coming out, and they're often in like the genital region or thighs of women, and I don't know for sure, but the, this reminds me an awful lot of like the Mullerian type um, epithelium that you see like in the fallopian tube, so I suspect that there's some embryologic um, correlation with that, but I don't know. These are relatively uncommon. I have not seen very many of these in practice. So cutaneous ciliated cyst, 37. Uh, it's somewhat similar to the, the last one with a bunch of spleen muscle. One of those to suggest anal genital skin, so like median raphe cyst. Yeah, median raphe cyst, and oh, is it not going to focus? Come on. Okay, uh, this is, uh, it looks kind of like skin out here, but as you get over to this side, you can tell that it's actually stratified squamous epithelium with a uh, pale kind of cytoplasm and no granular layer. So this is squamous mucosa. You can particularly see it over here. It definitely looks like mucosa. And look what we see in the, uh, the submucosa or dermis, sometimes in sites where the skin and the uh, mucosa blend together, like in this, which is, this is uh, the ventral surface of the glans penis in this particular case. It can be hard to tell whether you're actually dealing with dermis or submucosa. So sometimes I'll, in my report, say dermis slash submucosa in areas like this because there's not a, a discrete dividing line. And look at all these bright pink uh, bundles here. These are all smooth muscle. Whenever you see skin or, again, mucosa, with a, a lot of uh, smooth muscle bundles under them, uh, always think about the... Um, the, uh, the penis or the scrotum, or in a woman, uh, the vulva, because you have smooth muscle bundles under the skin um, in those locations. But here we have a cyst, and it's filled with kind of a, a secretion that's thick in the middle. It's kind of inspissated secretion. Let's go look at the lining cells. And we've got kind of a nice uh, columnar lining here. There's a little simple cuboidal basal layer and then a nice uh, single layer of columnar cells. And in this case, you could almost wonder if they've got either apocrine snouts or kind of cilia. It's really hard to tell, actually. I think it's probably more like apocrine snouts. But we've got this columnar lining. Um, sometimes it can be pseudostratified columnar, but it can be also more squamoid or have other types of lining. It really varies. The key to making the diagnosis of this is the location. This is on the midline ventral surface of the penis, often near the gland, sometimes in the scrotum, and this is a median raphe cyst. So median raphe cyst, really the only location is it's going to occur in the, the median raphe, which is that line that runs down the midline on the ventral side of the penis from the glands down the shaft of the penis and along the scrotum. It's that kind of fusion plane, um, uh, if you think back to embryology, which I can barely do, but embryologically those two uh, uh, side, the bilateral parts of the, I think the genital fold, if I recall correctly, fuse together and they leave that little line in the center, which is the median raphe, and a little cyst that can get, um, can, can grow in that um, site is the median raphe cyst. So a nice example of something that I also don't see. These are one of the, one of those uncommon cysts that I rarely actually encounter in my practice. So a nice example uh, to get to see something that's uncommon. And again, look at all the, the smooth muscle bundles in the background. And also note the presence of abundant nerves. Um, in the glans penis particularly, there are not only a bunch of smooth muscle bundles, but there is a, a rich concentration of nerves, obviously a very uh, sensitive anatomic site that needs a lot of innervation. So that's nerve all right here. And these are all smooth muscle bundles. Uh, median raphe cyst.
right? From low power, uh, this is an acanthotic epidermal lesion. You can see the kind of more normal epidermis out here. And then here you can see that the epidermis gets thick and there's relatively even thickness throughout. There's an elongation of the reedy hyperkeratosis over top. And um, one thing that I notice is there's this kind of gentle undulation of the surface, kind of these rolling hills and little little small valleys. And it's, it's reminiscent of the Veruca plana um, and that's because this is a form of Veruca plana. And look, just like Veruca plana, it's acanthosis, hypergranulosis, gentle undulation of the surface rather than those long finger-like projections of a Veruca vulgaris. It's the kind of rolling hills of the Veruca plana or the flat wart. And when you look closer, you can see the beautiful halo effect. These uh, cells have this kind of pale, pale gray or vacuolated cytoplasm that leave nuclei floating in the center. And this is basically HPV effect. These are, are basically a form of coilocyte. And they are kind of have that pale, pale gray to sometimes clear cytoplasm. And not just a vacuole. Remember, keratinocytes can have lots of uh, vacuole artifact. Like, look, that vacuole right there, that's a kind of vacuolation artifact you can see in keratinocytes all the time. To see a coilocyte or an HPV type effect in skin, what I want to see is a large nucleus. The nucleus is enlarged. They're often kind of pale, nuclear chromatin. Sometimes they have nucleoli, like you can see here. And the cytoplasm tends to be more of a pale color to me rather than a perfectly clear vacuole. The appearance is very different than the raisinoid kind of coilocytes that you often uh, learn about when you're talking about cervical cytology. And to any cytopathologist watching this that might disagree with my description, I apologize. I'm, I'm not a cytopathologist. But in skin, at least, these are what coilocytes look like. And in flat warts, you tend to have more prominent pale coilocyte type change than you often see in Veruca vulgaris. But there's a special thing about this Veruca plana. This flat wart has this awesome blue gray color here, this very distinct color. Nothing else really to me looks like this. This, uh, these large, um, enlarged uh, keratinocytes have this very prominent blue gray, kind of slate blue gray color. And this is a very special type of Veruca plana or flat work called epidermodysplasia verusiformis or EDV. And it's caused by a variety of different HPV subtypes that give you this very distinct blue gray appearance, which I find so incredibly um, aesthetically pleasing to look at. Uh, there is a form of this disease that is due to germline mutations in the ever one uh, EVER1 and EVER2 genes where people get uh, have a special predisposition to get this type of HPV infection and they get numerous flat warts and they have a higher risk of uh, developing squamous cell carcinoma from them. But the vast majority of cases of EDV that I've seen are single individual lesions that occur sporadically in patients that don't have any syndromic association. So sometimes they can actually be um, sampled as a Veruca plana. Clinically, they're the, the lesion that's being seen. But actually, much more often in my practice, I'll see them in the background of, you know, an adjacent to a basal cell carcinoma or something else. And I'll just see a tiny little focus, like about this big, of these beautiful blue gray keratinocytes that have that EDV change. And in those settings, it's totally an incidental finding of no significance when it occurs in that setting. And I, in fact, I don't usually mention it in my report, but of course, I'm sure to point it out to any students or residents or fellows sitting with me because I just never get tired of seeing um, epidermodysplasia verusiformis, EDV. A really, really great example of it. And it also, if you take the blue-gray away, a really classy example of a regular Veruca plana flat wart uh, in the background here. So kind of a hybrid lesion here almost of regular Veruca plana and then EDV form of Veruca plana right next to it. Really cool case.